Welcome to the Copper Spice YouTube channel, and thanks for joining us. In the next three videos, we will be talking about the building blocks of modern C++. Modern C++, from the beginning to the middle. These are the fundamentals and the building blocks of C++. In order to program in C++ effectively, you really need to understand data types, expressions, and value categories. When you know the difference between an R value and an R value reference, move semantics and forwarding suddenly makes sense. And knowing these fundamentals will allow you to see when a copy will occur versus a move. Data types and expressions are principles that are part of computer science. These are both ideas that are well-defined, but they radically changed in C++11. A more complex type system was introduced as a way to support move semantics. To understand the difference between an L value and an R value, we're going to need to go back and define what a data type is and what an expression is. So let's start by looking at the question of what a data type is. We need to know what the data types are in C++. Can new data types be added? What things are built in? And along the way, we need to look at some of the unusual items, like whether void, null pointer, references, or lambdas are data types. And if these aren't data types, then what are they? So here's the definition of what a data type is. It's a classification identifying the possible values for that type and the operations which can be done on values of that type. So let's continue and look at various categories of data types. Very few computer languages allow primitive types to be defined or added. So when you start looking at a computer language, you want to know what primitive types do you have to work with. In C++, you have things like care, int, bool, double, and float. These are built into the language, defined by the language, and they can't be changed. There is an odd quasi-type called void. Void has an empty set of values and is mainly used as a return type for functions. In some contexts, it can be used as a data type, but it's not legal in all contexts where a data type would make sense. So sometimes void is referred to as an incomplete data type. Another category are built-in data types. These are also provided by a computer language. Things like a hash table or complex numbers. These data types can be built into the programming language, or sometimes they're provided by a standard library, as in C++. Composite or compound data types are data types that are built on other data types. An example of a composite would be an array or a structure. STD vector is a classic example of a composite data type. The most flexible category of data types are the user-defined ones. In C++, we have several mechanisms for creating user-defined data types, including enums, but the most common mechanism that we use for adding data types to the language is by declaring new classes. It's important to understand that every time you define a new class, you are adding a data type to the C++ language. A user-defined data type is usually composed of built-in or composite or other user-defined data types. Another broad category is the abstract data types, and this consists of any type which does not have an implementation. Oftentimes this is taught as an object-oriented programming design technique, but it doesn't necessarily involve objects. However, the most common form of an abstract data type in C++ is an abstract class, which has methods that are declared but not defined. This means you cannot directly instantiate an abstract class, so you must instead instantiate a child class. For example, a stack might have push and pop methods, which have well-defined behavior that the caller can depend on but could be implemented in any number of ways depending upon the underlying data structure. Under the atomic data type category, there are two subcategories. The first one refers to components which can be accessed individually. 
For instance, the single character X is considered an atomic data type. If you're looking at the string chocolate cake, this is not atomic since it can be decomposed into individual characters. The other category of atomic data types are those with a specific meaning in multi-threaded programs, and they're data types which are guaranteed not to have data races when accessed simultaneously among different threads. These are somewhat related but different categories, and it's important to understand the difference. This makes atomic data type an overloaded term, and it can sometimes be confusing. The next category is a pointer data type. Foo1 and VAR2 are both part of the pointer data type category. But since Foo1 points to an int and VAR2 points to a widget, Foo1 and VAR2 are different data types, even though they're both part of the pointer data type category. When you're working with pointers, you need to be aware of the fact that a pointer refers to another value stored somewhere else in memory. And if you don't have a lot of experience with this, you can think about pointers like a scavenger hunt, where you start at one location and you get given a clue as to where the next location is, where you will find the actual objective you were searching for. Once we start working with pointers, we have another set of questions that come up. For example, assume that in the body of your class you declared a private data member that is a pointer to a string. And the question is, is this pointer private? And is the string that it points to private? And the answer is that yes, the pointer is certainly private because it is declared in a private portion of your class. However, Based on this snippet of code, you have no way of determining whether the string that it points to is private to your class or shared by some other piece of code elsewhere in your program. To talk about how references work in C++, we need to start by looking at what references meant in C. The actual C language did not define the term reference, and so programmers were free to define it to mean whatever they wanted. Since Function arguments in C are always passed by value, and this can be very costly. People wanted the effect of the computer science term passing by reference, which means that only a reference to the data is passed. To get this effect in C, you would pass a pointer to a function. So C programmers would refer to this technique as pass by reference. However, C++ defines reference with a very specific meaning. And it's important to understand and untangle the connotation of the computer science term of pass by reference from the very specific definition that C++ places on the reference data type. Because in C, when you would use a pointer to pass by reference, you're actually passing a pointer by value. And that has noticeable side effects the called function must dereference the passed pointer to access the actual data, and changing the pointer that was passed will not affect the pointer value in the caller because it was passed by value. Probably no other term in the C++ language is as mixed up in many people's minds as reference. For example, the idea of a range-based for was added in C++11, but since this term didn't exist, in C or C++ prior to the C++11 standard, there was no prior usage of the term to confuse it with. It was not all that difficult to untangle its meaning. Reference as a term has been used so heavily in computer programming and computer science before its specific definition in C++ that it's very difficult sometimes to extract the exact meaning when we're talking about the code. So the key takeaway here is that a reference in C is an abstract concept. In C++, a reference is a data type. The reference data type has always been part of C++, but in C++11, they added new reference data types, basically for the ability to add move semantics. So let's take a moment to contrast pointers and references. The fundamental defining characteristic of a reference 
is that a reference to an object is exactly the same as the original object. For example, when you take the address of a reference, you get the address of the original object. In this example, we have an object, a widget, called button, and we have a reference called pb. Once pb has been declared, it is completely indistinguishable from the original object button. So this assert will never fail because pb and button are the same object. They occupy the same location in memory. It's also important to note that many people who moved from C to C++ were taught the lesson that references were just a syntactical wrapper around pointers. This is not true. And in C++11, it is not true in any stretch of the imagination. There are things that you can do with references in C++11 which cannot be done with pointers. References and pointers are two completely distinct categories of data types, and they are not interchangeable. The function pointer data type is another kind of pointer, but it points to code instead of data. It can point to any function with a signature that matches the way the function pointer was declared. It's invoked by name, just like a normal function call would be. And this is often used in C for callback functions, which is when you pass a function as an argument to another function. It's not used as much in C++ since we have more expressive techniques available to us, but it still exists and is used. The declaration and usage of a function pointer looks like this. This line of code declares a function pointer named myProcess. It can point to any function which takes an integer parameter and returns void. And then you can call myProcess passing an integer just as if it were a normal function. C++ extended the function pointer category into method pointers as well. This slide shows an example of the declaration of a method pointer. My method is a pointer to a method in class widget that takes two integers and returns a bool. In order to call the method that my method points to, we first need a widget to call the method on, and then we use the arrow star operator to invoke the method, passing, in this case, a row and column number and receiving some data. This syntax may look a little odd, and it is. This is a rarely used corner of the language. Here are some more examples of method pointers showing declaring a method pointer, how to initialize it to point to a specific method, and how to do both in one step. The Lambda data type existed in other computer languages, like Smalltalk and Lisp, and was added to C++ in 11. The syntax in C++ is very unique. A Lambda expression can be thought of as a shortcut for a functor. A functor is a class that acts like a function, and it can return values and accept parameters. The basic syntax for a C++11 Lambda expression looks like this. We first have the capture list, denoted by square brackets, then the parameter list, denoted in parentheses, an optional return type set off by an arrow, and then the body of the Lambda enclosed in curly braces. The capture list lists the variables from the enclosing scope that should be made available inside the body of the lambda, and how they should be captured, whether by value or by reference. This capture list can be empty. The parameter list denotes the parameters that will need to be passed to the lambda later on when it's invoked. This acts exactly like a normal function parameter list, and it can as well be empty. The return type is the data type that the lambda will return when it is invoked. This normally can be deduced, and the situations in which it can be deduced have gotten more relaxed in later versions of C++. The body is just like the body of any function or method. It contains the list of statements to execute when the lambda is invoked. 
The capture list has undergone some changes in the different versions of C++ since 11. C++ 11 allows capturing by value or by reference. C++ 14 added a great deal of functionality, which included the ability to capture by move, which is very useful. C++ 17 also adds the ability to capture the object that you are declaring the lambda in by value. When using lambdas, you need to be very aware of scoping and what variables you are accessing. If you are capturing anything by reference, it's also important to ensure that the references are still valid when the lambda is invoked. If you capture by value, then the value that's captured is automatically captured as const to prevent you from modifying values in the lambda later. If you really want to modify the values that have been captured, then you need to declare the lambda mutable by placing the mutable keyword before the return type. So here's an example of how to set up a lambda and how you call the lambda. The int var equals 42 is a standard line of code to define var. The auto my lamb followed by the square brackets, parentheses, and curlies is the definition of the lambda. After this definition, we redefine var equals seven. The last line of my lamb is what actually calls and invokes the lambda. The question is whether my lamb will actually do an output saying the value of 42 or seven. This depends on the capture list. Since var is captured by value, at the time that the lambda is declared and defined, var is equal to 42. So the line of code that changes var to seven does not affect the output in my lamb. This completes our discussion about data types. In our next video, we will start with a detailed discussion about expressions, value categories, and how they relate to data types. For more information about CopperSpice and the CopperSpice libraries, please visit our website at www.copperspice.com. Feel free to contact us if you have any further questions. Thanks for watching our video. We hope you found the content of value. Please make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and come back in two weeks for our next video.